We have already <clears throat> mentioned somewhat the problem of magnetism. But this evening, it might be well to go a little further into this subject uh, for certain practical purposes that may ultimately have a considerable bearing upon the practice of therapy in the modern world. We are all becoming increasingly aware that what we call uh, the science or art of medicine is coming inevitably to a dead end. This does not mean uh, that the physician will no longer be useful or that there will no longer be need for healing on various levels of human need. The dead end is a materialistic limitation upon the concept of therapy. It is not going to be possible to continue to lock from our consideration those parts of man's constitution which are real though invisible. Nor shall we be able to indefinitely neglect an investigation of those forces around us which, though unseen, have a continuing effect upon our lives. It is astonishing that our researches in electricity have not done more for us in terms of open research into the field of electrical energy. We are still without an adequate definition of the word electricity itself. And we are certainly without an adequate understanding of the nature and substance of this energy. Assuming that such knowledge is not available to man, we have contented ourselves to define forces according to their actions or the consequences which they produce and have been willing to remain indolent so far as exploring the actual nature of these forces, perhaps under the general assumption of an ine inevitable defeat, that we may not be able to know these substances or energies due to the inability of our own faculties to grasp their meaning or to explore uh, their operations and laws. Yet from early time, men have intuitively sensed that which they were not always able to rationally uh, describe or explain. And among these who have possessed intuition on this subject, a quantity of knowledge has come to be accumulated. This knowledge is largely true, but this is one of those so-called unfortunate truths for those who have held to such truth are themselves persecuted, humiliated, or ridiculed. Like Paul, they are births out of time. They belong to a generation of greater enlightenment than our own. Researches into the nature and substance of magnetism or related matter bearing upon this may be traced as early as the time of Pythagoras in the West and was certainly known at a still earlier date in India and China. Yet it was not until comparatively recent times that any serious effort has been made to apply the principles set forth by these earlier thinkers to the living problems of modern man. One of the pioneers of this unfortunate truth of magnetism was the celebrated Anton Mesma. Mesma had an unfortunate personality and this can often complicate 
uh, the attainments of even the most brilliant and sincere person. Being somewhat of a controversialist, belligerent, and quick to anger, he brought down upon himself a great deal of unnecessary trouble in an area where there was sufficient necessary trouble to have occupied his time. As a result of his own somewhat theatrical bearing and flair, he opened himself to considerable ridicule and persecution. Yet substantially his findings have been sustained and more serious, quiet, and demure persons have carried his work far beyond the degree which he had attained. Why Mesmer should have originally uh, placed most of his essential concepts in cipher and code is not perhaps entirely clear. He may have had a mercenary uh, intentions, for he was not above such considerations. He may have decided that this type of information should be circulated only among those who were his students and to whom he would supply the necessary key to the code. Fortunately, of course, the code has long since been deciphered, and we are in fair knowledge of his essential findings. Mesmer advanced his principal beliefs in what are called 27 propositions. Uh, these unfold more or less sequentially his findings, and to read them is to recognize his indebtedness to the earlier works of Paracelsus von Hohenheim. There is also a legend that the mysterious Count St. Germain assisted Mesmer in the formulation of his doctrine. In any event, uh, his findings were based upon the earliest concepts of magnetism that have descended to us from primitive peoples and from the oldest recorded times. It is not necessary for our purpose to examine all of the 27 propositions. But for sake of accuracy, I would like to read to you the first and second proposition, which I do think has a bearing upon our problem this evening. If I have any trouble in reading it, it's because I scratched it hastily and I'm not always able to decipher my own cryptogram. <laughs> but I will do the best that I can. His first proposition is, there exists a mutual influence between the heavenly bodies the earth, and living bodies. That is what he calls his first proposition. The second is the extension of this to the field with which we are concerned. A fluid, universally diffused and continued, so as to admit no vacuum, whose subtility is beyond all comparison, and which, from its nature, is capable of receiving, propagating, and communicating all of the impressions of motion is the medium of this influence. Now, these are his two basic uh, propositions or hypotheses. He follows, as we have said, the concept of Paracelsus and the Arab that what we call the atmosphere or the intervals between planets and suns on luminaries, that this entire area is filled with a mysterious fluidic substance. This perhaps is the famous ocean of Thales upon which he believed the earth floated. And according to him, earthquakes were caused by someone rocking the boat. Now this might again be closer to the truth than we know if we consider this field of magnetic energy motion. It is already suspected that seismic upheavals may be due to electric or magnetic causes. 
This also may be the mysterious sea described by Heraclitus, who declared that souls coming into generation first passed into a strange, humid uh, substance, moist but invisible, which enclosed the earth and which, to a measure at least, communicated itself to the earth through the precipitation of rain. Uh, this humidity carried by water was, however, separate from and superior to the fluid in which it was carried. Socrates described water as consisting of a mass of minute solid, dry units, and that the flowing of water was the falling of these units over each other in an endless concatenation. All of these speculations carry us likewise to the belief that the sun was the principal source and regulator of the magnetic fields of the solar system, and that by extension, all energy or magnetic motion arose from the sun, and that its alternations, variations, polarizations, fluxes, and influxes were due to motions, tides, or various changes upon the sun or within the construction thereof we would be inclined to go a little way along this road in, recognition, in recognizing the effect of sunspots, which would represent, therefore, some change upon the surface of the sun, uh, which produced marked modification on the earth and among the creatures that inhabit the earth. When we know that sunspot maxima are carefully and eternally noted in the rings of trees, we can also realize that this phenomena does have certain terrestrial significance. Mesmer then went with Paracelsus to the theory that as all forms in nature exist within this humidic magnetic field, that all these forms likewise have a magnetism of their own, have their own magnetic fields, which are subservient to that of the earth and the sun, and also are subject to a certain modifying negative influence from that solar light which is reflected from the surface of the moon, which forms a different kind of magnetic energy. That the human body should be thus supported by a magnetic field was evidently known to peoples also in the past. Many individuals have existed who possess some degree of native psychism, who had a measure of vision beyond that of the more conservative human. Uh, these have recorded continuously through the centuries the appearance of a light, vapor, or field of energy surrounding the human body, which has come in mysticism to be called an aura, but which might just as easily be regarded as a magnetic field. Under certain conditions, almost anyone can to a degree perceive this aura, or can become aware and sensitive to its existence. And it is quite possible that this magnetic field is very important as a possible means of communication between man and other forms of life in nature, which communication up to the present time has been considered impossible. The magnetic field of the human body, as St. Thomas Aquinas uh, pointed out, possibly basing his researches upon those of his teacher, Albertus Magnus. Uh, these fields in the body were subject to tides, 
were subject to motions of one kind or another. Albertus Magnus pointed out that the fluids in the brain were controlled also tidally by the motion of the moon. Thus it is conceivable that at least three, probably more, types of pull or push pressures may be found operating upon magnetism. One of these, of course, is the sun, which in its motions and in its various internal mutations uh, certainly affects magnetism, affects the earth in many ways, and it is probably the magnetic field rather than the actual light which is responsible for the phenomenon of the seasons. There is also a mutation or influence resulting from the a reflection of light from the sun on the surface of the moon and its final uh, descent to the earth. This type of magnetism has been noted to be noxious and according to old magicians was used by sorcerers in the attainment of their diabolical ends. The third type of influence might arise directly from the earth itself which has its own internal motions and mutations and is subject, like all other living creatures, to gradual alternation of magnetic polarity. Thus we today recognize the two poles of the Earth, one geographic and the other magnetic. The uh, magnetic field of the Earth has been considered to some degree. We are not entirely unaware of it, nor have we forgotten what the Chinese learned when they experimented with the compass. We know that magnetic currents of some kind do exist, but for some reason we have never directly attempted to apply them to therapy, except in the case of a few extraordinary and regarded as deranged researchers. The magnetic field of the body itself may therefore be similarly described as that of the sun, namely that it is a fluidic material, fluidic to our comprehension, but probably not fluidic in its own nature. It gives the impression of a fluid, but it is far more subtle than any fluid that we know. I think Mesmer termed it fluidic because he perceived within the substance of it certain tidal motions, certain ebbing and flowing, which we associate with a liquid of some kind. But it might just as well be associated with these magnetic patterns which seem to lie beneath the surface of frost pictures on a window pane. Mesmer was convinced that this magnetic material formed not only a natural field around man, but was to large measure the basis of a certain protection. In other words, a person in whom the magnetic field was strong and was normally sustained apparently had greater resistance against uh, the dangers of infection or many ailments which might otherwise afflict us. The um, reference to contagion and infection uh, is rather important. We must assume that all forms of bacterial life, regardless of their size or structure, are also magnetic units. This does not mean they have no other existence, but it does mean that anything that exists does possess magnetism as a means not only of its existence, but of its animation. Thus also, infection may be said to have a magnetic existence, and the corruption of flesh is a magnetic process just as surely as we might regard it as the result of poisoning, blood poisoning, or something of that nature. 
If, therefore, a person's magnetic field be strong, it is quite conceivable that it would repel the magnetic fields of bacterial organisms, causing some degree of immunity, if not complete immunity. And there are numerous records which cannot be explained of persons immune to ailments who may even be carriers of those ailments, but will not be affected by them. There are also many interesting evidences and records, such as that referred to by Sir Kenlon Digby, one of the great physicians of the first Elizabethan period, in connection with wounds and the development of his remedy, the weapon saw, by means of which he was able uh, to assist the healing of a wound by bestowing certain magnetic substances upon the weapon causing the wound. Such may seem to be highly exaggerated reports. Some of them probably are exaggerated. For once man gets hold of an idea, he is very likely to abuse it, particularly when it is so abstract that uh, practical checking is practically impossible. In any event, however, the possibility of the magnetic field of the human body serving as a protection against evil is possible and quite probable. Also, that this magnetic field uh, is further divided within itself so that miniature fields surround all the principal vital organs and parts of the body and that this magnetism moves in the marrow of the bones, and that it also flows through the nervous system. These uh, points are worth noting. Mesmer himself directly associated magnetism with the nervous system, declaring that it uh, definitely circulated through the body uh, by means of the nerves and that they contain within themselves this mysterious semi-fluid substance, uh, invisible and entirely absence, absent in the dead, but available in the living and controllable by those who know, knew how to operate the magnetic laws. Uh, Mesmer went still further in affirming that the principal source of derangements within the body might be claimed to have magnetic origin. He, of course, gives us some further moral suggestion, and others have also supplemented this, and we will come to that in a moment. We are dealing now merely with the mechanical aspect of the subject. Thus it would follow that the human being is not only subject to the law of nature, but is subject to the polarized activity of solar magnetism. Perhaps this is what Plato implied when he declared that the earth and its people pass through alternating periods of fertility and sterility, and that these periods uh, correspond to the ages of the ancients. These periods may likewise correspond to the yugas of India, the divisions into various degrees of spiritual fertility uh, with which uh, the ancient Brahmins measured the duration of the world. In periods of sterility, as Plato points out, not only does vegetation uh, and all of the natural qualities of the earth languish to some degree, but there is a marked deterioration in the, the life of human beings. In periods of sterility, he points out, there are not many great and true leaders. There are not many enlightened mystics and philosophers. Uh, there are few indeed great artists musicians and creators. In these periods of magnetic sterility, 
the human being loses something of his overtone and therefore finds the struggle uh, to solve the mystery of his own existence far greater than in more fertile periods. When, however, the solar system moves into an era of fertility, all things flourish and the vegetation becomes more abundant. And with the vegetation, the consciousness of man becomes more notably uh, elevated and he is more creative and productive not only in the physical matters of life, but in those which relate to the mind, the heart, the emotions, and the soul. If such periods in the magnetic field um, uh, may be related to the sun, it is likewise evident that there must be lesser cycles moving within this greater one. One such cycle would be that of the moon, another of the earth itself, and still other cycles imposed by the very duration of the human structure and by the various seasons of man's life as referable to the seven ages of man and to the climactrics which mark the various divisions of human life. Thus, Mesmer tells us, the available magnetism at any given time may not be the same as at some other time. These currents with their various tidal motions may bring abundance or scarcity. And we might wonder, perhaps, uh, the possible relationship between this humid or peculiar subtle fluid and the researches now being carried on in atomic fission. It is quite conceivable that if there should be damage or danger rising from uh, the development of these uh, uh, electronic and uh, atomic explosives, that this danger might lie in their disturbance of the magnetic field. If they succeed in disturbing the magnetic field of the Earth, the effect will very likely be conveyed to the magnetic field of man. Therefore, he will not experience his difficulties from the outside, but will experience them in terms of his own available energy. And it has been noted even up to now uh, that experimentation in this field has been accompanied by notable devitalization among many persons and has permitted ailments to advance more rapidly due to the devitality of the patient. All these matters must sometime come to general light, although they are now obscured by an indifference on the part of most of our learned people. Considering the problem of magnetism still further, Mesma pointed out that just as the year has its seasons, so likewise there are seasons within the life of man. He is not only subject to the winter around him, but to winters within him. He is not only uh, affected by the great cyclic motions of the universe, but by smaller cycles, based upon the fact that he is himself a miniature world, a microcosm, in whose constitution all larger processes are reproduced in miniature. There is also a, sim a sympathy between these larger processes and their miniatures in man, so that all of nature is bound together in one vast pattern and governed by rules for which there are no exceptions. The magnetic field of man is also, we are told by the ancients particularly, subject to the moods of man. And just as it is possible that universal mutations are due to universal moods, moods of aspects of cosmic life or mind about which we have no comprehension, so it is more immediately demonstrable that the various changes in the attitudes and dispositions of human beings are immediately reflected in the magnetic field of the body, and that this reflection 
perhaps, is the very basis of the operation of the law of compensation as this is applied to the activities and conduct of mankind. If, then, these magnetic fields can be distorted from their normal function, their motions, their rhythms, their ebbings and flowings disturbed by man's own contributions in form of mental or emotional intensity, it must naturally follow that we have here the basis for immorality. We have the basis for probably the most essentially certain code of conduct which it is capable uh, for us to know, or possible for us to know. For example, if any attitude results in an unfortunate mutation in the magnetic field, that attitude must be wrong so far as man is concerned. Any thought or emotion which is harmful to his energy resources must be contrary to the intentions of the law by which he is controlled or directed. For all such negative mutations must contribute ultimately to sickness and possibly ultimate death. Thus, if man's conduct is under the censorship of its effect upon his magnetic currents, then we begin to perceive a means of clarifying or organizing a code which not only must apply to the relations between persons in this world, but must also protect the, the energy resources of the individual performing various actions or holding various attitudes. This, in turn, points up one of the strongest positions in the magnetic theory. The moment it is conceived to be possible that man's energies can be influenced by his conduct, we then begin to approach a field of therapy. For we have established a valid law, a law by which we can develop certain propositions, beliefs, ideas, formulas, methods for the practical administration of that law. We mentioned before this idea of the river and the water wheel, and that someone discovering the tide motions or the flowing of the river uh, resolved to improve his own estate by putting a wheel there and allowing the waters to turn his wheel and thus activate certain instruments or implements which he used. In the same way, once we become aware of the laws of magnetism, we are able to use this substance uh, for certain advantages. These advantages, we hope, will not prove to be economic but they can very definitely contribute to our well-being or to advance some form of our way of life. If these fields can be more thoroughly explored, we shall then begin to recognize a number of practical working solutions. Mesmer suggested a few. And based upon his concepts, we can point out his idea that each person having a magnetic field and two persons coming close together, if these fields are sympathetic, the magnetism flows not from one person to the other, but through both persons, creating thereby a sympathy or an ability to be near with comfort. If, however, these magnetic fields are antagonistic, then the magnetism of each person is turned back upon himself, the result being an instinctive antipathy, a failure of friendship, or a failure of a desire to become acquainted with someone. 
it is also suspected that so-called inanimate objects have magnetic fields. And recent experimentation with certain hypnotic drugs uh, by means of which temporary psychic uh, vision uh, was uh, artificially produced show has shown that certain things which we regarded as inanimate do have a life or energy of their own. That therefore we may discover magnetism in rocks, that we may find it in wood even after it has been built into a table, that we will discover it in foodstuffs even after they have been cooked, that we shall find traces of magnetism everywhere. And that this magnetism may also be traced in terms of sound. Hashish eaters uh, of the Near East and India, uh, those using this drug, report that they can see words coming from persons' mouths. And that these words have forms and energy radiations. The power or the creative expression of the spoken word or the creative word or the fiat may thus have more validity than we have been inclined to recognize. Any unit of vibration has a magnetic equivalent, and this may go still further. It is, it is conceivable that ideas have magnetic fields, that archetypal patterns whether in nature or in man, are magnetic. That dream experiences are more or less sustained by magnetic energies. And that many uh, very subtle things uh, are actually magnetized in one way or another. Paracelsus pointed out the magnetism of geometric forms, patterns, and solids. And other experimenters have found the magnetic emanations related to color. And I've also been aware that colors create certain areas of conditioning within a magnetic structure. So does music. And uh, practically every expression of art has its magnetic equivalent. Thus the subject, which seems to start as a rather small and perhaps highly specialized one, develops gradually into a large and general theme. For the moment, however, let us consider the possible effect of the intricate psychological pattern of man's behavior upon his magnetic structure. As man has moods, these moods may be likened to the moods of nature around him. Within man there may arise tempests. There may be terrible volcanic eruptions. Uh, there may be periods of doldrum. There may be exceedingly high temperature or low temperature. All kinds of things uh, can occur which influence the climate of the human personality. All these influences react upon the magnetic energies available to the sustaining of the body. If these reactions are excessive, or if man's mental or emotional pressures pollute his magnetic reservoir, it is obvious that his body may in time be corrupted. Thus habits may be measured in terms of their influence upon magnetism, or the possibility that their regular occurrence or reoccurrence may cause the gradual depletion of the energy available to certain functions of the human body. Paracelsus was convinced that the diseases of man constitute a formula. That this formula means that there is a relationship, an exact and specific relationship, between the various aspects of man's consciousness and the afflictions which burden his flesh. 
He did not feel that we could merely say that man's attitudes poisoned his magnetic core, and then this poison merely distributed itself through the body, wrecking havoc here and there. He held that each attitude has a particular effect, and that this effect in turn will be symbolically set forth through a particular function, process, structure, or organ within the human body. Thus, all intemperances of all their complex and diversified orders and kinds may be directly related as causes of ailment, and the appearance of certain ailments may thereby, by reverse procedure, bear witness to certain intemperances in the life of man, whether these intemperances are recognized or not. Out of this thinking has come uh, a doctrine which is somewhat uh, reminiscent of that of the Indian yoga, namely that salvation for all things lies in non-interference. The moment man blocks or obstructs the processes of the universe, he is sick. If this sickness does not immediately affect his body, it affects his emotions causing him to be unhappy or to suffer, uh, stressed or strained, these likewise being forms of sickness. Man, therefore, must, uh, in the greatest degree possible, maintain the harmony of those attributes of his own nature by which the fields of energy which surround him can be over-influenced. Uh, the old mystics reported a considerable color symbolism in the magnetic field, and this has been sustained by the findings of Dr. Kilmer. It is therefore possible to say that the moods of the individual result in color mutation in the magnetic aura or energy field, that these mutations may also take on geometric or symbolic form and that every attitude of man has a kind of existence in magnetism as an artificially created creature. Of such creatures uh, were the elementaries of Paracelsus, as distinguished from elementals. Elementals were to him the nature spirit. Elementaries were beings created by the intemperances of man and given a survival or existence within his own magnetic field. And these, in turn, became parasites, living upon the magnetism which should have been directed to the pursuit and development of useful functions. These so-called thought or energy forms have been, to some degree, classified and examined. And it becomes increasingly certain that man can cause vortices or structures within the magnetic field, and that these vortices and structures can have a decided and important influence upon his life. Next in the importance in this consideration is one which perhaps we should all think about. After Anton Mesma, uh, passed from the stage of public interest. His successors and followers continued to examine his theories uh, with considerable thoughtfulness and care. And gradually, the various instruments or implements which he used in the production of magnetic crises, especially his celebrated magnetic tub, uh, came to be discarded. It was evident, as pointed out by the French Academy in the last quarter of the 19th century, that no such implements were necessary, that magnetism required no devices, required no machines uh, for its operation, that it could be most successfully operated by the simple action of the human will, and that where this will was directed, the magnetic currents could be mutated 
or cause to change their general course and direction. I'm using the word mutation here in the sense of mesma, and not according to certain modern usages. Mutation meant to the ancients a change or modification within a structure. In this uh, meaning, then, uh, Mesmer created a system and supported that system by means of certain instruments. It was later decided that these instruments were important only because Mesmer thought they were. He created devices because he was still bound to the concept that therapy required machinery, that there had to be some physical structure for the controlling and directing of the magnetic agent. He accomplished this direction not by the instrument, but by his belief in the instrument, not by the machinery, but by his own mental activity in which he preconceived the effect of his own treatment. Thus he was actually using mind, but the machine which he devised became a catalyst for his attention, an object upon which he gave faith or importance, and as a result of that used it to focus what might otherwise not have been a sufficiently intensive belief in the value or validity of this process. As soon as it became evident that it was no longer necessary to use such instruments, it was then rather obvious that the magnetic agent was strongly under the influence of the mind. This again would go back to the older theories, because in the Greek and classical philosophies, the mind the controlling mind of the universe was the mind of deity. And it was through the medium of magnetism that certain mental energies of the deity were disseminated or distributed as through currents or as by means of channels by which uh, the energy could reach into the most remote areas of space. Magnetism assumes that this energy is not strictly free-moving, that while it is everywhere and in everything, it is channeled, and that within space itself are certain processes or channels by means of which the free motion of energy retains a form or a kind and is not dissipated. We have the same concept today for in broadcasting a radio program, we know that the program does not pass in its visible or audible form uh, from the sending station to the receiving station, but that it is transformed into waves of energy, and that these waves of energy retain their own organization. They are not like another drop of water dropped into water that is instantly dispelled. Rather, it seems as though they might be drops of water dropped into oil, where they remain isolated and retain their own form and structure. Or perhaps we can liken them to the grooves on a phonograph record. For without these grooves, without this systematic process by means of which the sounds or vibrations are held, in this case, upon the substance of the record, uh, they could not be reproduced. Thus, in nature, the magnetic substance also supplies this medium of carriage and later became associated with the great so-called uh, medium of science, the hypothetical substance, ether, which was used without much understanding to explain other mysteries still less understood. In the uh, development, therefore, of this concept, mind was able to direct magnetism 
mind was able to direct magnetism from a person to another person. And for all that we or Mesmer could know, this mind was capable of projecting magnetism to an indefinite distance. This indefinite distance, perhaps constituting the sympathy which has been recorded between persons at a great distance, who still were conscious or aware of the actions of each other, as in the case perhaps of the death of Lord Nelson, for at the time he died at Trafalgar, Lady Hamilton fell in a swoon in England, declaring that Nelson was dead. This sympathy, according to Paracelsus, was due to the possibility of the projection of the mind in the field of magnetism and would simply be a very rarefied, attenuated uh, parallel to our concept of radio transmission. Magnetism may then likewise be controlled or directed within the body of the individual by the mind of that individual, meaning that magnetism can be intensified in one part of the body or another according as need may arise. This sub subtle substance could therefore be molded as the child molds sand in a sandbox, that it could be directed by an action of the, by, uh, the volition of the animate will and could be caused to be greater in one part of the body than in another, or could be reduced in one area, so as to affect whatever remedy might be needed. Nature, apparently, has done this itself. And here is an interesting theory about which we may hear more sometime. If volition, consciousness, and mind are the peculiar agents by means of which magnetism can be drawn, then in all probability nature has set up pain mechanism for that purpose. In other words, pain causes acute awareness. Pain causes the individual to turn his attention upon the area where the pain exists. Pain accompanies many forms of injuries. And pain seems to be a subconscious natural remedy by means of which healing materials are drawn to the area with the attention of the sufferer. Pain sets up a local voice, a local vibratory rate, and to this area with which we have become peculiarly aware through pain, energy has a tendency to flow. As an example of the truth of this particular point, we can mention that hypnosis will cause the person to be unaware of pain in an area or become aware of a pain in some other area where it does not exist. Therefore, pain is essentially a mental phenomenon. This phenomenon furthermore, has to do with the need of energy. And wherever this pain occurs or is set up, the person gains a greater awareness of that particular area. Uh, in the old uh, researches, the uh, simile is to the man who hits his thumb with a hammer that instantly magnetism moves into that area. Actually, for a moment, the individual forgets himself and remembers only his thumb. His consciousness centers upon his thumb. And with the center of consciousness moves the energy or magnetism. Therefore, a very heavy congestion of magnetism containing necessary elements of energy Gather at this point, as the pain resi resides, the individual uh, becomes less aware. 
of this uh, particular area and is no longer conscious that it is giving him trouble. Other things besides uh, pain can cause the gathering of energy. If these other things are not relevant, if there is no real need of energy in the area to which it is suddenly drawn in an exaggerated way, it will set up tension or hypertension. We know in uh, the pharmacopoeia that there are certain medications which if taken by healthy persons will make them sick. But if taken by persons suffering from certain ailments will assist to remedy that ailment or will bring immediate relief. It is, for example, rather well noted uh, that a person suffering from extreme pain may use certain narcotics with comparative safety, but if he uses them without the pain, he is very likely to become addicted to narcotics. In magnetism, the same principle seems to hold true. Wherever man turns his attention, particularly within his own body, he is apt to embarrass this rather shy and uh, retiring structure. For instance, the man who becomes stomach conscious or who becomes too much interested in some function of the body is likely to disturb that function by drawing to it energy which is not required. A singer, becoming too conscious of the structure of the throat and the technique of voice production, will have difficulty in singing and will lock his voice. Whereas if he becomes completely absorbed in his music and becomes unaware of his own existence, he will sing with relaxation. These seem to indicate not mere tension, but tension drawing materials. And these materials, not being necessary, cause a superabundance, which in itself becomes a difficulty. If, however, these materials are desperately needed for some remedial process, uh, then the centering of energy brings with it relief and help. We might go so far as to suspect that egoism or egotism, excessive self-centeredness upon the concept of ego or upon the concept of self may cause tension in this area and may be, re and may be one of the causes of why the egotist is seldom a happy or well-adjusted person. Centering energy where it is not necessary, where it literally and actually does more harm than good. Energy to be, is to be centered only for emergency. And when it is otherwise centered, it is uh, of little value. Also, the magnetic field becomes an immediate carrier of mental impulse much more rapid, much more powerful uh, than any conscious process can be. A good example of this is learning to play the piano. The individual must go through a considerable preliminary period of training. The purpose of the training being to gradually eliminate hand consciousness. As long as he must guide his hands by an active process of volition, he will be slow and stumbling in his music. When, however, he reaches the point where the hands react automatically to the impulses of the mind and will, so that they become comparatively unknown to him, but serve him effectively, then he becomes a more satisfactory artist. It seems then 
that and mental energy can be carried almost instantaneously to any part of the body where it is needed, and that this subjective method of communication with the parts of the body is more necessary and more important than any conscious willing of these parts to perform a specific action. The next point, again, follows from these. And that is that the mind, being able to direct energy, is subject to certain limitations and infirmities of its own, by means of which the direction of energy may be wrong or may miscarry. Or in the case of the magnetic hela, there is always the possibility that a preconception of the nature of the ailment a faulty diagnosis, a demand for the use of energy in a certain way may bring the patient difficulty rather than improvement. It is therefore uh, true in this as in all other things that the energy field of the patient must determine the patient's need and not the intellectual attitudes of the physician. This is subtle and takes away from the field some of its most interesting aspects. We are curtailed in our glorious privilege of exerting mind over matter. We are no longer set up as arbitrary determiners of what others need. We have so long attempted to diagnose by formula, by tradition, by precedent, and by certain schools of technique, that it has not occurred to us that the magnetic field of the patient is a living diagnosis at all times. You may remember, of course, the charming story, A Caesar's Column, by Ignatius Donnelly. In this story, which anticipates the progress of man into the future with something of the spirit of uh, Edward Bellamy, but perhaps not quite so optimistic, uh, an invention is described resembling a watch, which the individual can wear as he would a watch, and can look at it whenever he feels like it, look at his watch and say, hmm, a little bilious today. That this uh, magnetic instrument, small but powerful, will enable him to, to, to tell at any time the condition of his own health. The operation of the instrument, of course, depends upon magnetism. This uh, has not yet quite been perfected. We might have done it by now had we not been more interested in reaching Mars or one of the other uh, members of the remote solar family. But it is still conceivable that such a device could be devised. And it is even more important to remember uh, that the magnetic field of the body must always present the true and inevitable condition of that body. Therefore, it is not the mind of the individual who is judging, nor is it the mind of the patient who is explaining his symptoms. It is actually the state of the electric currents of the body and their relation to the needs of the occasion. Uh, thus, the tendency to create a highly arbitrary system of therapy is to a measure checked. And we begin to uh, consider uh, the various moral and ethical involvement the individual can recover only when he ceases to cause his own sickness. If he ceases to cause it, he in all probabilities will be gradually relieved of its symptoms unless the damage has gone too far. Then he may be assisted, or he may be beyond assistance, as the case may be. But certainly, uh, the condition of the body 
is the result of a certain psychic pattern pressed upon the body by what Bailey calls a seal, the seal of the composite archetype of the character itself. The magnetist approaching this has only one of two or three courses open. He must either develop that kind of internal sight by means of which he can read the magnetic field accurately. And this particular ability is not always possible. He has a second recourse, and that is to merely provide the body with an additional amount of energy derived either from his own body or from some adequate source of magnetism. There is a third possibility, and this is perhaps the one that can come the closest to our present comprehension, and that is that it is conceivable and possible for the individual to feel or to sense without seeing, to know as though intuitively the condition of the magnetic field of another person. He thus is uh, given the impulse. It may come into him and be interpreted with extraordinary clarity. In some cases, magnetists have actually, actually experienced in various parts of their bodies the very pains from which their patients suffered. More usually, however, it is a kind of mental uh, recognition, a recognition like a flash of inspiration, a recognition which is a sudden knowing, which would seem to imply, in turn, that the magnetic field of the other person was capable of sending a message or transmitting a message which flowing into the magnetic field of the physician was transformed into a mental idea. Many so-called magnetic healers of modern times have described their abilities to diagnose as being this intuitive method or this extraordinary circumstance of suddenly feeling in the corresponding part of their own bodies the ailments from which the sufferer complains. This type of cognition is itself, apparently, a transmission of magnetism through the nervous system. The next interesting phase of our problem begins the study of what can we do to take the place of thinking in order to control by the mind or by some attribute of consciousness uh, the function of the magnetic field, either our own or someone else's. Early in the 19th century, it was pointed out that certain broad, general attitudes seemingly caused broad and genuine changes within the magnetic structure. And uh, entirely apart from their interest in theology, these researchers came very close to the opinion of St. Paul, as expressed in Corinthians. For it was learned through experience that the three most powerful emotional or mental projections by means of which therapy could be attained in the magnetic field were the three attitudes of faith, hope, and love. These were therapeutic. Hate destroyed. Love restored. Faith dis uh, built or created. Fear or lack of faith destroyed. Hope was a creator. Despair a destroyer. Now, in our conscious living, these uh, various attitudes tumble about uh, in almost constant confusion. At one moment we are hopeful and the next we are fearful. 
In one moment we have faith, and in another moment we are faithless. But let us uh, assume certain principles and see whether they make sense, perhaps better sense than we suspect. During the last 50 years, perhaps a little more, the uh, civilizations which have led the world for centuries have gradually developed a powerful materialistic complex or culture. Until today, the leaders in our various walks of life are very often persons of little faith. They have not recognized the importance of strong, constructive belief in terms of health. Having lost much of their religious anchorage and having no firm ethical structure to take its place or to even help to compensate for its loss, we find it quite conceivable that the general, the general lowering of the level of simple faith, faith in good, faith in right, faith in truth, faith in God, that the losses in these forms of faith might very well result in a general um, dilemma relating to magnetism. If the absence of faith is a loss, and if criticism in the place of faith is little less than a destroyer of energy, then negative attitudes, as they become more prominent, should cause us to be more exhausted. And I suspect that if we had a very accurate poll taken at this time, more persons would complain of being tired than ever before in history. This tire is not due to labor, for we have never probably had as great a possibility of leisure as we have now. Our exhaustion we credit to psychic fatigue and recognize it as a major ailment. If fatigue itself bears witness uh, to a depletion or a wrong tidal motion or even to the reversal of the current of a magnetic field, we may then assume that the tremendously increasing sense of doubt, of insecurity, of downright fear, combined with a loss of a natural tendency to cultivate sensitive, constructive attitudes, that the direct machinery by which our attitudes affect our flesh may be through the magnetic field. We may also assume that a collective magnetism, where millions of persons holding certain negative attitudes create a common dilemma, might go so far as to affect adversely the magnetic field of the planet. For we cannot assume for a moment that man suffers alone. We have to also assume that his negative psychic and emotional attitudes affect the other kingdoms of nature around him. And uh, we are even now concerned with various uh, circumstances resulting in loss of harvests, in the failure of trees to bear good fruit, in the failure of many natural processes, we have assumed various causes, but it is possible that among these causes will be found the, genuine, the general inertia or depletion resulting from the collective effect of our own attitudes upon personal and earth magnetism. This may sound far-fetched, 
but it is no more far-fetched than the radio sounded a hundred years ago, had anyone dared to discuss such a possibility. We are in an age where we are becoming aware of the sensitivities of life around us. This awareness must open us uh, to considerations of, of substances and facts not hitherto uh, regarded as legitimate or important. If then hope, faith, and love are therapeutic attitudes, it becomes evident that we have a scientific reason for faith. We have the proof that faith developed in man at some remote time because he intuitively recognized the need of faith. That faith came not from the imposings of the clergy, but came originally uh, from the interior need for comfort. Not spiritual consolation alone, but simple physical comfort that the individual then began to organize these primitive impulses to the formations of creeds and codes. This we can accept. But because all primitive peoples make use of various magical forms involving the control and directing of magnetism, even now, we may suspect that they were aware of the important facts. We talk of the importance today of a good attitude. We think of it, however, largely as a platitude. We have the feeling that if we have a good attitude, other people will like us better, that we will be more popular. This is no doubt true. But is this friendship that results from better attitude merely based upon this external situation, or is it based upon the change in the magnetic field which can be intuitively recognized by others. We know that persons of various temperaments have had adventures in life which would signify or indicate that their internal natures affected those around them. It is a common problem, for example, that does not infrequently arise, uh, that certain physicians and nurses uh, have better effects upon patients than others. This effect cannot be based upon appearance, for one may be as prepossessing as another. It cannot be based upon efficiency. They have all received more or less equal training. We may say that it could be based upon the attitude of the doctor or the nurse. But in some instances, they are at least certainly not aware of their attitude and are very hurt and disappointed when the patient does not respond favorably. Yet it is almost a certainty that if we leave a certain nurse with a certain patient, he may not recover. Something is wrong that cannot be corrected by efficiency, kindness, cheerfulness, or anything that we know. There seems to be an, antagonized, an antagonism on the level of the magnetic field. Thus certain persons in all relationships can be fortunate or unfortunate in terms of their own magnetism. Does this mean that such magne magnetic attractions and repulsions are inevitable? Does it mean that certain persons will never be able to get along together? Does this to a certain degree reflect itself in the comparatively high rate of divorce from which we suffer today? Is incompatibility at least in part an element of magnetism? I think it can be in a good many cases. There are also indications that there are people who cannot get along together, who will not be able to, 
or will never be able to make a sufficiently great adjustment in their own characters that they will be able to become compatible. Uh, this occurs not only in the more intimate associations, but also in business and in social activity. There are people that will never be drawn to each other. And if they are accidentally brought together, there is no spark of friendship or recognition. There is only, at best, an indifference. Now, the problem of indifference also plays a part in our magnetic theory. Energy moves with interest. It moves with concern. It moves with all kinds of active attitudes. It does not move, however, from indifference. Indifference is the ultimate degree of detachment. It means that there is no sympathy, no relationship, no common ground. It does not necessarily stand for an antagonism in the magnetic fields, but it very often prevents any interest or direction of energy by means of which an acquaintance or an association can be improved. Now, in uh, religion, mysticism, philosophy, and these situations, indifference has never been regarded as a virtue. And when we refer to a certain kind, shall we say, of detachment, we do not imply indifference. Indifference is so completely likely that it calls and draws nothing. And quietude, or the suspension of attitudes, <coughs> is not indifference. Indifference represents failure to report any stimulation or any uh, activity of interest. Whereas man seeking to relax or to attain freedom from pressure is not working with indifference. Uh, to uh, make a virtue of indifference would be equivalent to making a virtue of ignorance, or to assume that a not knowing is good. In nature, not knowing is never good. False knowing is also bad. Right knowing is very important. Indifference is not relaxation. Indifference is not protection. And the individual who becomes indifferent or attempts to get out of a situation by departing from it physically and psychologically uh, will gain little benefit for himself. Rather than indifference, there must be a strong but perhaps rather impersonal sense of values. Again, this term is a little dangerous, for the impersonal individual may be without sympathies, and sympathy is the principle upon which magnetism moves. Therefore, detachment must not and should not be unsympathetic. It becomes, therefore, necessary to refine and regulate values to the end that we hold the proper attitude toward ourselves and to all other creatures. That this attitude cannot be assumed merely by an action of the will or a determination of the mind is also evident. The attitude must become a total part of the life itself. The attitude must arise in consciousness and be communicated therefrom directly into the fields of energy which support the body. Researches by Mesmer and others have shown beyond doubt that the magnetic field to operate best must be in a state of tranquility. Tranquility simply means now normalcy, nothing more than or less. Excitation or the tremendous upsurge of intensity is not normal. 
depression or the reduction of energy to the state perhaps of inertia is not normal. And one of the forces or circumstances which causes the greatest havoc in man's uh, magnetic structure is uncontrolled and excessive emotional outbursts. These cannot do any good on any plane. And on the psychic plane, they do much harm. This causes people to say, but uh, these outbursts are natural to us. We might also say, by looking at the available text, particularly the World Almanac, that sickness and death are natural to us. Very few of us get out of this world alive, at least in terms of our physical existence. Things that are commonly done, habits that are commonly practiced, may be common but not natural. And we would not be in the difficulty we are in today if things commonly done gain virtue by the common doing. They do not. Things done badly never become a virtue, even though every other living being does them that way. So everything which causes explosion in the energy fields of the body will have an effect similar to an explosion in the earth or to the explosion of a bomb such as was dropped at Nagasaki or Hiroshima. These explosions cause tremendous cataclysm. And in our energy field, they are nearly always followed by intense deple depletion or depression. After one of these emotional outbursts, the victim simply says to his friends, neighbors, and enemies, I feel terrible. Tired out, worn out, and ashamed of himself. This type of attitude, again, represents the waste of energy. And as energy is life, the waste of it is bad, especially bad, when this waste, as in the case of an excessive outburst, immediately reacts upon the body, injuring its fabric, and thereby hastening its ultimate dissolution. In the same way, excessive grief, excessive worry, and fear cause immediate damage and all irrational or unreasonable attitudes, attitudes that are unsympathetic, critical, defamatory, attitudes which are known in conscience not to be right, all have been proved to be magnetically bad. It then seems to be uh, indicated that health to the individual can be very often greatly changed or helped by his own uh, ability to direct energy. Man is not yet so completely endowed with understanding, self-control, organization, the ability to remain a fair and reasonable and temperate in all his attitudes, that he is able uh, to escape all of the ravages due to the, uh, we will say, the corruption of his magnetic field. He can improve, however. Death is said by Milton to be the last great enemy, and it will probably be the last to be overcome. But man may certainly enjoy better years and have a greater sense of security as he gradually and in an orderly manner and according to his ability unfolds temperance within his own nature. By so doing, he reduces the wear and tear of life uh, to its possible minimum so far as he is concerned. 
In this respect, likewise, we recognize that certain attitudes, having certain effects and results, may be associated in the correction of various ailments of the body. Records at an early time pointed out that there was a very strong and important magnetic sympathy between a mother and child. This magnetic sympathy was polarized through the thymus gland, by means of which a very powerful magnetic pole of the mother remained in the body of the child, active and operating, till about the seventh year. Up to that time, maternal concern for a child can have greater effect and more immediate consequence than any other period of life. And there are definite cases in which a mother, confronted with a child desperately ill, has practically brought that child back to life by the immense concentration of its own devotion upon that child. There are also cases uh, by reverse action, for it is by the sensitiveness of this gland that the child is psychically aware of the most secret emotions and thoughts of the mother and may therefore be subjectively affected. It is in this case particularly important that the parent maintain, so far as is possible, a good attitude, a peaceful and tranquil attitude, at the time in the life of the child when the parent is most tempted not to have such an attitude due to the burden and pressure of the occasion. Thus we may say that parenthood becomes a great test in magnetism. And uh, we can't expect two perfect results, but any improvement will be appreciated by all concerned. Because the child at that time, bound to the thymus gland, is practically like an identical twin with the mother. And almost any thought or emotion of the parent will move into the child's mind. The child at that time is far more uh, receptive to these thought and emotion pressures than to any word or visible example which the parent may give. Actually, as the thymus gland becomes symbolic, therefore, of a kind of psychic umbilicus between parent and child, so as the human being grows into his physical and intellectual maturity, most of the connections between his physical body and his magnetic field are associated with the other glands of the endocrine chain. The thymus gradually becomes non-operative in the normal person. And where it remains operative too long, it produces serious consequences. The particular area of the magnetic field in the human body is the spleen. And in the area of the spleen, these currents focus or center from uh, the sources of energy supply. From the spleen, they form their own central dynamo and begin to radiate outward to form the magnetic field of the body. Most of this magnetism is therefore centered, as we pointed out before, in the abdominal area. And from this area, it spreads. Depletions of energy may therefore be most immediately recognized in digestion, assimilation, and excretion. And the effect of tension, stress, or negative mental and emotional attitudes upon these areas is particularly notable. For among the first indications of tension is the disruption of the digestive procedure. To restore that again is to release or break down tension areas. In another phase of our problem, the magnetic healer is sometimes confronted with an obstruction or a blockage in the flow of magnetism to one part of the body or another. Uh, such obstructions may rise from several causes. They can be psychosomatic, for each part of the body, as Leonardo da Vinci pointed out, has a certain 
relationship to all other parts. One of the most simple analogies lies in the old distribution of the signs of the zodiac and the planets among the sections of parts of the body as set forth in the familiar old cut-up man of the almanac who is shown usually with the constellations grouped around him. This uh, association, however, can be carried to much more intensive and definite degrees. Wherever magnetism is blocked, there is either a derangement or there has been a fatigue which has resulted in a process of crystallization. This process of crystallization inhibits the continuance of magnetism even after the fatigue has passed. This means that to meet this kind of a situation, special pressures or concentrations of magnetism may be necessary. As many obstructions in their earlier states are not attended by much noticeable pain, uh, that type of warning which we find in connection with uh, the outer surface of the body, wounds, the scars, boils, and things of that type, this type of warning is not available. There is, however, always some kind of warning. And the most common warnings are failures of processes, such as digestion and assimilation, minor disturbances of the heart, sense of tension, nerve, or stress, the gradual loss of the use of a member or part, or the failure of its function in the general biological economy. Wherever such situation arises, the magnetic healer has the tendency to try to exaggerate temporarily the current of magnetism into the, in the body of the patient. Thus, we must assume that a successful magnetic healer must have considerable magnetism available to him. If his own supply is highly limited, or if he is unable to form a channel to the general source of magnetism, he will not be successful long, or if he is, will deplete himself and perhaps wreck his own health. Experimentation is the only way in which the magnetist can determine the degree in which he can expend energy with safety. Also, of course, as energy is expended, as in all the habit processes of nature, it is apt to increase. Therefore, the use of energy may cause the magnetist to find an ever-increasing supply. That is, if everything be right in the proposition. By sending energy specially into areas where it may have been depressed or where the natural currents of the body are not able to break through, the magnetist can break up congestions, can stimulate sluggish functions, and can open the body to the remedial use of its own energy. Thus, the person having been relieved of the obstruction may then be able to take over with his own energy fields. Now, we have mentioned the most common and universal sources of this magnetic force. We might, however, point out that there are certain other sources which can be and are important to the individual. One of the most common and familiar of all sources of magnetic energy is respiration. But by means of respiration, energy is taken into the body and is distributed by the heart through the entire uh, arterial circulation. Another important source of energy is nutrition. Uh, we are not certain that direct exposure to the sun is as good a source of energy as was once supposed. The present tendency is to regard this as not the best form, and it is frequently accompanied by fatigue, and too much exposure seemingly causes certain structures or materials in the body to be stimulated to an exaggerated degree. The best sources of energy, therefore, arise from 
the mixture or the normal life of the person. In our normal living, under normal conditions, we have certain uh, resources supplied by nutrition, by respiration, by light, air, and sun. We also have certain relaxations and repose, and it is during the period of sleep that the magnetic field does most of its repair work upon the ordinary wear and tear of the day. If the person, therefore, lives a relatively normal life, his energy supplies will be reasonably adequate or will respond very quickly to any form of specialized therapy. Today, the problem of normal living is becoming a very serious one, and most persons do not feel today that they are living normal and contented lives. As a result, there is continual depletion of energy without adequate replenishment. And one of the processes of the body, of course, which requires a great deal of energy, is the support of the intricate structure by means of which the mind operates upon the brain. This energy requirement is much greater than that necessary for the use of a pick and shovel, but a more refined type of energy is required. And as this rust must be refined from grosser forms of energy, it is evident that the refined part will not be as great in quantity as that from which it was refined. Thus, the need for the control and direction of energy resources, particularly at different periods of life, failure to adjust adequately and properly to the changing pattern of years can result in serious energy depletion. Having once come into a general understanding of the theme or subject under consideration, we can practice in a simple and ordinary way a great many uh, health-promoting procedures. We can, for example, uh, watch against such intemperances as may be corruptive of energy. We can control to the best of our ability mental and emotional excesses, and also negative mental and emotional attitudes. We can seek for that tranquility which is normalcy of function. Every sacred book of the world has preached man's interior peace. This inner peace does not mean stagnation. It means adjustment with life, acceptance of the will of heaven, the recognition of Tao, which in Taoist philosophy becomes a kind of cosmic magnetism or a universal energy which moves through space through the fields of the magnetic currents. If as the result of certain specialized problems we may have certain attitudes the magnetist will tell us there are things we can do that will help. One of the ways in which magnetism has been controlled, particularly in Asia, is through visualization. Visualization is a process of imposing upon the consciousness the picture of the state of well-being. Visualization, then, in connection with a wound, is the inner process of becoming aware that the wound is naturally and normally healing. If this is merely stated as a platitude, it is comparatively meaningless. But if it is held as a fact in consciousness, it will affect the availability of magnetism. For the magnetic field will accept uh, the pattern and move to fulfill it. Just in the same way, if a person inwardly experiences by a suspended but purposeful effort the tranquility of his own consciousness, if he will visualize himself as in a state of adjustment with life, 
he will find it easier and easier to attain this state in his outward experience. Thus, visualization means to see the thing as it should be. Now, we may not always know just what it should be, and our visualization does not have to be ultimate. Our visualization of a boil would be fairly easy. We know what it should be. It should not be there, as far as our comfort is concerned. But it is there because of a cause. Therefore, visualization does not frustrate cause. It does not assume that the boil has no right to be there. It cannot do this and accept natural law. But it does visualize within the person an attitude, a condition, a state of being in which the suspension of negative factors removes the cause of the boil and results in the visualization of that kind of peace of soul and peace of mind which is not likely to cause boils, or if they do exist, will most quickly promote their healing by removing the, uh, the negative factor and also by that complete relaxation which permits the energy field to move into the area of the boil and do the remedial work. It is also possible for a person or a magnetic healer to temporarily stimulate the energy field around the boil, causing more magnetism to gather there, and in this way to hasten the processes of recuperation. This hastening is not an unnatural or an abnormal one. It is simply a hastening of the natural curative processes of life itself. In alchemy, one of the ancient formulas was that man perfects nature. Man working as the handmaiden of nature, cooperating with all natural processes, obeying to the best of his abilities all natural laws, releases in his own life and in the lives of those around him all of the energy available in his constitution. This energy moves like a cleansing ocean, magnetism burning up corruption, clearing it, taking it away, returning it to the great mystery of the solar power in which it is incinerated and removed. This energy, if given all possible and reasonable support by man, will do its work better more quickly than it can accomplish this work if it must at the same time fight against a group of negative reactions. Thus therapy begins with tranquility. It begins with the gradual development of this consciousness of hope, faith, and love, by means of which the person achieves a rapport with life itself. And this life, thus coming in, without interference or interruption, without being wasted or lost through excessive uh, expenditures that are meaningless, this life accomplishes its perfect works. And it was one of the beliefs of the ancient magnetists that God and nature intended man to be well. Sickness is not any more a natural state of man than war is a natural state of nations or crime a natural state of society. Sickness is the result of man's being unable as yet to perfectly understand the rules governing health, or in one way or another, for selfish or even unselfish reasons, violating those rules. Such violations may appear to be justified, as in the case of the physician who may exhaust himself sitting up with the sick, or it may not appear to be justified, as in the case of intemperance and uh, general waste of energy. But whatever be the cause, the energy that is used in one way cannot be used in another. 
the more our legitimate demands upon energy may be, the more heavily our profession or our life calls upon our vital resources, the more we must protect these with our attitudes. The individual who does nothing might have greater liberty to make mistakes than the person whose energy is constantly required. But by the proper direction of energy, through attitude, particularly through these attitudes recommended by Paul, faith, hope, and love, man living in these moods, in these ways, and achieving a certain tranquility in his own nature, will find that his energy is greater and that when emergency arises, his recuperation is more rapid, that he is be less likely to infections and corruptions of the flesh, and also less likely to create those emotional and mental situations which must require st still more expenditure of energy to mend or correct. Thus magnetism becomes a kind of conscience a censorship upon all action. And for those who keep its rules by obeying the principles of the powers which move and direct energy, it becomes a kindly and helpful friend, a source of life and sustenance. But if it is outraged, it turns upon the person who breaks its rules, not because it does not like them, but because they have set up obstructions to energy. And in religion, to set up an obstruction to energy means to set up an obstruction to God. To set up an obstruction in the body means that there will be somewhere an inadequacy of the soul. So in these thoughts and in this type of thinking, magnetism becomes a field for science, also for philosophy, and for religion, and it becomes one simple key to how the average person can help himself if he is so minded in many small ways, and if he can do this successfully in many small ways, he may prevent part at least of the need for having something done in a big way. As often these small causes contribute together to some serious con consequence. So the correction of small mistakes will help to maintain the grand economy of the complete person. Well, I think our time is up, and that is all we can do for this time. Now we're going to give you two weeks' vacation on Wednesday evenings, and then we're going to start a new series here, which I hope will prove of general interest to all of you. I don't have a program of the series at the moment, but I know what they are about. We are going to deal with the problem of the mandalas, the meditation disciplines, diagrams and symbols of Eastern peoples as these are used in various religious, philosophical, and mystical uh, researches, conditions, and devotions. And we believe this will be one of the most interesting series we've given, so we hope you'll all be there. And we thank you very much. Thank you.